to Sabbath School. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. And it is an absolute joy to be with you. Now, here, here's the thing about uh, today. We would love to see you participate and uh, be able to, to share with us. We've got enough folks up here to, to talk all day long, but we would love to, uh, to see you participate and, and talk as well. And so I'd like to, to invite you guys to be, uh, be a part of this. So we've got two microphones right up here. And there, I just noticed there's nobody manning these microphones to take them around. Um, so I, I, see, uh, I, I see a couple of folks that we could pick on, uh, unless we have any volunteers to go around. So first we'll ask, hey, do we have a volunteer to grab a mic and take that around? All right, we got one, and I need one more. Uh, all right, come on, come on up and grab a mic. Uh, one, one person can hit the left side and the other one the right side. You guys decide which side that is. All right, let's, uh, let's bow our heads together and have a word of prayer, and then we will, we will begin. Father in heaven, thank you for another day of life. Thank you for bringing us uh, together this morning and for the incredible message that, uh, that we had this morning from uh, Dr. Holland. And we ask, Lord, that you will draw close to us through this, uh, th through this weekend and on this Sabbath day as these messages are, are tearing at the heartstrings, Lord, helping us to understand that indeed we are living in the last days. This morning, Father, we're up here asking that, uh, that you will bless as we read and study the Word of God, looking at the story of Esther. We ask that, uh, that your Spirit will be here, that you open our hearts and minds to understand the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Our topic for such time as this, uh, taken out of the book of Esther, and so we are sort of deviating a little bit from the typical Sabbath school um, because we want to cover Esther as part of this, of this weekend. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles. If you didn't bring one with you, you may have your electronic Bible, or there could be a Bible there at the pew, and you could take a look at that. Let's go to Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1. And wow, you have a really wide margin Bible. That's nice. All kinds of space to write on. All right. Esther chapter 1. Beginning at verse 1, Esther chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. And we're going to read a few verses together to just kind of set the stage here. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces, provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of the kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of the reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. Verse 4, And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all, and when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present at Shushan the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise and white and black marble. Verse 7, And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not com com uh, compulsory, I almost couldn't pronounce that. For so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to, the, to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with the wine, he commanded uh, Mehuman, uh, Bizda, Harbona, Bigtha, Ab Bagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs, eunuchs, who served in the presence of the king Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. All right, there's, there's the, the beginning of, of the story of Esther. Most of us know this uh, story really, really well. And it's really sort of incredible. It's 180 days of, of partying. 
Can you imagine that? 180 days. It's like having your birthday 180 times in a row. 180 days. And then on top of that, that's not enough. So that was just kind of like for, the, for the, uh, the rich people. Now we're going to invite the whole kingdom. We're going to do some more partying, and we're going to do it for seven more days. Now, uh, just curious, um, those of you who were listening to Pastor Holland, he made reference to another book in the Bible. What was that book in the Bible that we just talked about? We really didn't study the story of Esther necessarily in this uh, first service sermon. We were looking at another, another book in the, in the Bible. What was that book? Daniel, you guys were paying attention. Wow, for those of you who are teachers of the Milo School, now you know your students actually listen to you. This is fantastic. Yeah, but Dan, it was the book of Daniel. This is incredible, Daniel. Now, as you read or as I read through this particular story, tell me, think, 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 think. Tell me what stood out, what kind of things or what storylines or what even chapters, if you remember, out of the book of Daniel are very similar to the very first opening verses of the book of Esther. And you guys uh, can answer that as well. Anything that struck you as, you, as, as I read through that? Well, I thought of Daniel chapter 5. That was a big party going on there. That's right, Daniel chapter 5. There's a huge party going after in Daniel chapter 5. By the way, what was the, what was the end of that, uh, that party? How did that end? wasn't so great. <laughs> that was not so great. That was actually the end of the Babylonian kingdom at that particular party. Anything else that stood out to you as I read pertaining to, to Daniel and maybe specifically that party that was in Daniel chapter 5? What do you think? Well, one thing I noticed is that they both served drinks in golden vessels. Both ser served drinks in golden vessels. That's right. Uh, anything else that, that, that stood out? I just see like the commonalities between the two kings. Both of them really wanted to, to show off. In Hajjuaris' case, he wanted to show off, you know, we have this list of all of these, like, hangings of fine white and, and, and violet linen and held by, so this long list. And then we see the same kind of in Daniel chapter 5 with the golden vessels. He, 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 um, Belshazzar. Was that his name? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he brought it um, from, the, from the tabernacle. He really wanted to show off. So in both cases, we can see the kings, you know, trying to exalt themselves and pride. And we can see in both cases that it doesn't end very well. No, it doesn't. It doesn't end very well at all. Hold that on in the, in the back of your mind. Hang that on a hook somewhere. And now let's look at starting at verse uh, 12. And so, so one of you up here, if you will grab verse 12 and just read until I tell you to stop. All right, verse 12. Oh, that was loud. That was not <laughs> Welcome. Queen Vashti, I refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. And the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner towards all who knew law and justice. Those closest to him being Karshina, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Mirs, Marcina, and Memukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti, according to the law, because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus, brought to her by the eunuchs? And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also the princes, and all the people who are in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. And this very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him. And let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered. That Vastai shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give a royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree which he will make is proclaimed throughout all the empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Melmukin. Then he sent letters to the king's province, to each province in his own script, to each people in their own language, that each man should be the master of his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Okay, you can stop. Amen.
Amen. And that was the end of the chapter. All right, so, so now you, you have the beginning of the story. We read it through about verse 11, and down, then you see the, the second part of the story. Now, tell me, on this second part of the story, what stands out to you in particular about the whole, the whole thing? Any, anything, just, just share. What stands out to you? We'll start connecting dots here in just a moment, but um, tell me things that stood out to you in this second part of the story. We see a lot of pride throughout this whole story, I feel like, okay. over and over. That's kind of the root of what drives decisions a lot of the time in the story, and it's the same thing. The king's pride was wounded, so he took measures off of those emotions instead of thinking clearly because his mind was clouded by the choices he had made leading into that. Absolutely. How about you guys? There's a hand right here. I, guess I, should, I should hold the mic because the internet people won't be able to hear me. So if you want the mic, just, just grab it, just take it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it something I think is very interesting is verse 17, where it says, the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so they will despise their husbands in their eyes. And I think that was not only for that time, but I think that is also for this time. Okay. Anybody else? Something that stood out to you? Uh, just bouncing off of what you were saying, um, I was thinking about this too, how the sad relationship between Vashti and King Ahasuerus was um, not really built upon mutual love and respect. It was more, um, had the foundation of weakness, which is kind of sad to see. Anybody else? I see some young ladies in here that are just dying to talk. You knew I'd pick on you, right? You see a hand, right, right back there, right in the back. Um, so I was reading over this a few months ago and something that really stuck out to me was very rarely does Vashti get credit for how incredibly brave she was. And I think sometimes we always look at what was going on with the Jewish people in the story, but this, she actually is a role model in this story too for Christians. Um, and I just, I would love to talk to her someday about what that would take because some of his rulers even said that they understood the politics and how the king was. And it was understood that for those times, the king's manner towards all that knew the law and justice. So he was a very fierce man. Um, and everybody knew that he was kind of unstable. So the measures that she took, I think we, we have a lot to learn from that too, that she got out fast. There's a hand up here. There's a hand back there too. Um, we were talking about that kind of in the car about Vashti, like nobody really kind of recognizes that, that she really stood up like that. And we were, we were kind of pondering like, what actually happened to her? Um, Cause I like, a lot of kids watched a lot of Veggie Tales <laughs> when I was growing up, and, and I remember the one about es about Esther. Am I still on? Yeah, yeah. Still on. it just sounded different. Whoa! I remember the one about Esther and how Vashti just kind of, you know, she packed her bags and she left. But I don't think that's how it went. And so we were kind of speculating and wondering, like, what what happened? Was she, was she killed? Was she was she dishonorably sent away? How did that go? So what she did, it's not really mentioned, but. Um, what she did was very brave, yeah. Go ahead. I just, um, going on what she said earlier on how Queen Vashti, Vashti, she, these princes and the king were married with wine, verse 10, and they wanted to bring her before them with her crown. And some people have said with only her crown, displaying her beauty and kind of parading her in front of these men. And she was... A woman of dignity that said no and yeah she might have been answering she could have maybe answered a little bit better or in a way to kind of a reason with him but also he was drunk they were all drunk they were not reasoning and later you see his remorse but um, also the fact that he didn't kill her somewhere I'm sure his conscience was saying okay like maybe I was in the wrong here I shouldn't have but once again pride they weren't gonna admit so I'm not gonna kill her because I know she was righteous and not parading herself in front of us, but 
they still, in his pride, well, how do I deal with this? Well, let's just put her away. And um, he regrets that later, but just the, the pride. And first of all, in all these situations, and officers can tell you, any scene of the crime, any where something's done wrong, alcohol is usually there. Kind of bumping off of what you said a little bit and the fact that obviously their 100 and some odd days of partying didn't help their decision making at all. And what jumped out to me is that they made a decision extremely rapidly. The king got, you know, king got mad, the queen didn't come. Boom, boom, boom. Within a day, they decided they were going to put this law out, get rid of Queen Vashti. They didn't take any time to, let me take a few days off from partying and let me think about it. They just went right into it. By the way, is it Vashti or Vashti? Anybody know? I say Vashti. Vashti, Vashti. Vashti and I don't think there's a Vashti in Spanish, so I'm just going to say Vashti. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that sounds better for, for, for my tongue. All right, hey, I, I want to I start, and, and we're starting here because we typically don't start here. We, we typically don't give this a whole lot of time. We end up reading that and say, oh, wow, that's terrible, and wow, she stood strong. Let's talk about Esther. And, and yeah, the book is, is called the book of Esther, but in some ways, it really should be called the book of Vashti and Esther. There are two very, very brave women in, in this story. And in, in just a moment, we'll talk a little bit about how similar the stories are. We were talking together this morning, and really what you're seeing is sort of a Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two reality here. In Genesis chapter one, you have the creation story. In Genesis chapter two, you have the creation story expanded. That's exactly what you're seeing in the book of Esther. Esther chapter one is the great controversy story. Esther chapter two and on is the great controversy story expanded. And we wanna blow that up in just a, in just a moment. But let, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about Vashti and her, and her uh, or Vashti, however flavor you would like, and, and her bravery. So let's, let's think about this. What were the ramifications of her decision? What was going through her mind? Uh, all of these things. Tell, tell, tell me what, what you think. What do, what do you think about this particular decision? The king comes to you and says, this is what I expect you to do. And then you're going to say, oh, I don't think so. So tell me what, uh, what, what's going through your mind there. I think it is surprising enough that she wasn't at the party. So she, she wasn't even there. So that says something about her character. I like that. I, I like to talk her character. Let's talk about her character. You know, we, we, we talk about Esther because she's a Jew and because she's a follower of God. But do you believe that Vashti has a godly character? What do you think? I think that there's, I like how you use the word bravery because that's one of the key words I wrote down on my notes is because we see bravery through the whole story and so many different characters. We see it in Mordecai standing up for what he believes in Esther and Vashti and all of these different characters, bravery and faithfulness to what God had asked them to do is super interesting. And the story in the book of Esther, like you were saying, is interesting because it's one of the only books in the Bible where God is not mentioned. So you're led to draw conclusions of character and you're looking at the people a little bit differently for the way it's written. And the bravery and the faith that they had through all of it is really interesting because their focus obviously was not inward. In everything, that's one thing that I noticed throughout this book is if they had been inwardly focused only, the stories would have been way different. If Esther, when she heard what had happened, had only looked to herself and had thought selfish, selfishly, um, she would have never made the decision she had. She would have never stood because she would have just been protecting herself. And so I think, that, I think that that's the common thread that you get to pull from everybody's character in the story, is the commitment and the focus on something bigger than themselves that Esther could even say, if I perish, I perish. It's not about me, it's about a higher calling that I'm living up to and exemplifying in this pagan kingdom. I think jumping off of what you said there a little bit, as 
one of the ways that you can compare the story of Esther to our lives today in that everyone in this story, uh, we're humans. And if I were to just ask the question, how many of you would be scared to death to do what Queen Vashti did or to do what Esther did? Did we decide Vashti or Vashti? I don't know. Either one. How many of you would be scared to death to do what they did? Chances are you would probably be really scared, but yet they still uh, went ahead and did it anyway. And that can prove to us that as long as we've got God on our side, it doesn't matter how scared we are. It's going to turn out right in the end anyways. I think that's incredible, like how you mentioned, like there's no mention of the name of God in this entire book, which is very rare for the Bible. Um, but yet you see, you can see through the actions of each of the characters, like, and it's in those, kind of like um, Pastor Chris Holmes was talking about last night, it's in those decisions. Every decision is important. Here we see a decision. We see good decisions and we see bad decisions. And we see, um, we see Vashti taking a stand. And then we see Mordecai literally taking a stand, not bowing down. And then we see Esther taking a stand and doing what is considered to be, well, not you know, acceptable, not appropriate. It's not according to the law, not according to the custom. And so we see characters who, who stand for what is right and who say no. And I think that's important for us today um, to say no to things is important because if you say no to one thing, you're saying yes to another, right? So for example, if I'm saying no to doing my, my homework on Sabbath, which I was very, very tempted to do last night, <laughs> um, we say yes to something else. And through that, we can see every decision has a consequence. Every action has a consequence. And others will see, that's what I was trying to say there, others will see, um, like, hey, this person said no to this because they were doing this, or this person said yes to this because they were saying no to this. There's always those two sides. And so just here with Queen Vashti, we can see she's saying no. And in her saying no, God said, yes, I'm going to come in and I'm going to work in this situation, in this drunken party. God is still there. God is still there. Yeah. Hand in the back. Do you also forget how human these guys were in that that's not how they started out. They started out, you did not know that they were Jewish. They hid their religion from people. They did not make it vocal to, to the people around them until the time came that they knew they had to make a decision one way or the other. And they knew that their decision was um, going to affect hundreds and thousands of other people. And it was beyond themselves. And so we realized that we are, we sometimes do that too. We, we, don't, we don't make it known. We don't stand up until God says, you know what, now is the time. And um, we, we sometimes forget that about that story. I, I was saying it about studying this a while ago and and that was a, a kind of a, a new revelation to me. You, you sometimes overlook. It's always, yes, they stood up. Well, they didn't stand up first, but they stood up when they had to and um, made a choice that um, saved people beyond themselves. And um, I was just also reading in my, my little study notes in my Bible, and it says, Vashti, um, lived many years later, and she became influential in her son's life who took over. So, you know, she, her, her influence did not stop there. Thank you for that, and I, and I, wanna, I, I, I wanna just talk about that for just a moment, because that's, it really, it's, it's a powerful thread that you're, that you're heading us into. Um, you had several people that stood up, as you guys have mentioned. Some stood up first and some stood up second. When you compare Vashti and you compare Esther, what's the irony about the sequence of who stood up first? Is no one going to say it? I'll say it. <laughs> uh, well, I think the irony is that Vashti stood up without being told anything. Esther had to be told kind of, not told, but just, you know, urged, like Mordecai, you know, who knows whether you've come for such a time as this. If you don't do this, somebody else is going to. You gotta do this. But Vashti just, just, just did it. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I saw you picking up your mic. I was going to say something, but you're picking up your mic, so. Well, I think it's interesting to contrast the results of standing up, too. Like, they both stood up for principle and moral, but look at the drastic difference of what the outcome was of that standing up. Um, we don't really know the outcomes of our decisions sometimes when we do take a stand for what we know is right. And is it possible that, that Esther had more courage to stand up because Vashti had already stood, stood up before? I mean, the fact that, that the simple fact, and, and here, and I think that Pastor Holland really, really sort of hit on this uh, yesterday a bit. You've got Jesus coming into, into Jerusalem, and, and all of the folks are, are, are waving palm trees and, and setting down their clothing, and, and, you know, the king is coming type of, type of scene. And the Jewish leaders come up to him and say, hey, listen, these, these folks are, are just absolutely wild. You need to calm all of this down. And what was Jesus' response to that? If they are quiet, what? The stones will cry out. Listen, friends, right now in the last days of human history, we are hearing the stones cry out. Why are we hearing the stones cry out? Because the Seventh-day Adventist church won't stand up and do the work. God is coming whether we like it or not, whether we're ready or not. And he's going to find his faithful, and he's going to have them stand, and he's going to have them preach the everlasting gospel. And if we won't do it, they will. God will finish this work. And in the story of Esther, you see a people that are hiding. You see a people that are scared. They're fearful to even, even let anybody know that they're Jewish. And here comes a heathen that says, you know what? I am, I am not going to go before a drunk king. And I can see how Esther could see that and say, you know what, maybe, maybe I should stand up a little bit. Maybe, maybe it's okay to stand up. And so how did God work in this particular story? It's, it's just like every thread in Scripture. He moved on the heart of someone that was foreign to Scripture necessarily to get them to encourage God's people. Because we, we probably need a lot more courage than we sometimes think. It's easy to say, oh, we're the Seventh-day Adventist church. God, God raised us up as a people of the book. We have the Bible. We have all these things. Uh, but then when it comes down to it, we, we fall really, really short. I want to talk for a moment. Look at the time, and it's just like, man, we're burning time. Uh, if we're late, Pastor Holland, you just have to forgive us, right? I mean, it's not like you're going anywhere. We're, we're going to be here all day long, so if we adjust the... Yeah, it might, might affect lunch, but, but you were talking about fasting yesterday, so hey, we'll just do what we got to do. Let, let's, talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about, um, about this concept of the great controversy. We know that we see the great controversy in chapters uh, two through, through the end. But I want you to now start thinking about the great, the great controversy war in chapter one alone. Because in chapter one, I believe you will find a synopsis, a very quick but powerful synopsis of the entire great controversy war. So let's talk about that and think, think through, through what, what that, that could be. You may have to read a couple of verses again, but let's talk about that. Open the floor up or up here. Let's talk about the great controversy in chapter one of Esther. All right, do you need a hint? Sure. How many parties do you see happening? Two parties. What's the difference between those parties? Let's talk about that. Well, okay. Uh, in one of them, we see that there is plentiful drinking and and the other one, we don't read that. The other is. All right, so you have, you have tons of drinking happening, tons of partying in one. The other one is, a, is a, more calm, a, a more calm party. Also, the other one is a banquet for women. The other one's mainly for women, yes. <laughs> yeah, so types and anti-types and symbols, sometimes they break down a bit. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going. Yeah, the other one was, was, was for women. Uh, but you, you have these two groups, right? 
you have these two groups, and one is a large, large group, and another one is a small, small group. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. All right, someone read verse 8 now. Verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. How many nations? All, all nations. Jump over to chapter 17, and let's, let's read one through, one through five, or yeah, one through five. Someone read one through five. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and spoke to me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornications. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So you, you, have this, you have this party that's happening in Esther chapter 1. You have this one huge, uh, massive party, 180 days and then seven days on top of that. Everybody has in, been invited. It's a huge, huge party. It's every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's the equivalent of that. And they are being given what to drink? Wine. They are being, being given wine to drink. You have this other party, and if you read it in Ellen White, you'll find out that this is actually a much more calm party. This whole partying thing is, is, not, is not happening. I think, I think you guys suggested it was a little tea party thing going on. Um, uh, I hope not because tea is horrible and, and yeah. Um, that's the way. It's, like, it's, like, it's like going outside and cutting down the grass and putting the grass inside your cup and then drinking that. I mean, I'm just going to leave it, leave it there. But, but you do have these two parties, but they're completely different, guys. They're completely different. One is small. It's a small remnant group, if you will. It's small. It is, it is, it is more holy. It is more righteous. And you've got this crazy party going on. And then in the middle of all of that, there's a command that goes, a command. Is that familiar? A command that goes out. Where, where was there a command in the book of Daniel that everybody needed to come and everybody needed to bow? What chapter is that? Daniel? No, no. Did I say, did I say Revelation? Yeah, yeah, Re Revelation. Uh, yeah, Revelation 13. She read my mind. I meant Daniel, but yeah, that is Revelation. <laughs> in Daniel, what, what chapter is it in Daniel? Daniel chapter 3. Everybody is, is called to come out, and everybody is to bow down, and how many, how many did not bow? Three. It's a small group. It's a small group. Revelation 13, too, there's a command that, that goes out, and, and everybody is to bow, but there's a group that doesn't. Who's the group that doesn't? It's God's people, right? Look at the similarities between Esther Revelation in the book of Daniel. You have two parties going on. A command has gone out. And God's people say, because of conscience, because of character, because of morality, I cannot heed that command. Even, even to the cost of their lives. I will not. I will not go. Let's talk about this, con this concept of having a command given to us in the end and standing up. Will we have a command in the end to stand up? Will we have a, com a command to go? Will we have a command to do things that we're not supposed to be doing? And what's it going to take? And that's where I want to really talk about now for a couple of minutes. What is it going to take 
in order to be a Vashti or be, a, be an Esther? What's it going to take? Let's talk about that. I love the, um, how Daniel and Esther and Revelation, you can see the parallels between them and how they kind of help to unlock the other books. And something that I thought about um, sitting here was those decisions and how, like, you know, Vashti, she, she stood up. She didn't stand up before, like um, Mr. Hansen was saying. She chose to stand up right then. But Daniel chapter 1, I think, gives us a clue to how these, these, these biblical figures can stand. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, I really like this verse. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. You can just stop right there. You could say that Esther, she purposed in her heart. Daniel purposed in his heart. Vashti had to have before have purposed in her heart that she would not do this. And so in Daniel chapter 8, we continue reading, Daniel would not defile himself with the king's food. He purposed in his heart. When did he do that? When did he purpose in his heart? That would have been far before he was even taken to Babylon. That, that purposing doesn't come all of a sudden. It's like, um, like Pastor Holland was saying last night, like we can't expect to all of a sudden stand all of a sudden when the trial comes. We have to purpose in our hearts now. And so to all of us now, young, older, nobody's old, older, <laughs> We can purpose in our hearts now. I like what Emilio was saying, and it reminds me of Ephesians 6.13 where we're talking about the armor of God, and it says, having done all to stand, stand. There's a preparation time before, and I loved how Pastor Chris brought that out yesterday. The choices that we are making, the little ones today, that seem like just tiny little choices, build the character that's going to make the decision when the big choices and the big deciding things in our lives come. Just like... We read here about the armor of God. Putting on that armor was a process. Have you guys ever seen the armor that they wore back in Bible times? It was a process to put it on. It wasn't just slip on a shirt and go. It was a process of putting it on, and it was a, it's a choice. It's a choice to pick up the armor of God and put it on continually, and it's the daily choices that get us to the point where we're able to make these decisions when it really counts because all the little ones along the way counted when we were making them. Amen. A lot of people like to compare it to a race where you don't train at all for the race, then you go out there and try to run the race, you're not going to come in first. And I think that's a good analogy, but I don't like it 100%. The reason I don't like it 100% is because to a certain extent, I can wait till a few weeks before the race, or I can have it planned out where I know if I practice for one month before the race, then I'll be okay. And so I think, oh, well, the race is two months out, I can wait for one month and then get to it. But the thing is that, like Pastor Allen was saying today, we don't know what tomorrow holds. And so when we're talking about, you know, standing up, that's something, a decision that has to be made now, today, because who knows, maybe you won't leave the sparking lot or this church today, right? It's something that has to be made now. Tomorrow never comes. Have you ever heard that story? Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow never comes. Has anybody heard that? The story? Oh, nobody? I guess that means I should tell it. <laughs> I'll be brief. So there's a little boy in this city, and he's walking by, and he sees an ice cream vendor. And the ice cream guy says, hey, buy a cone today. If you come tomorrow, the cone will be free. And so the little boy goes, all right, I'll buy my, my ice cream cone. So he buys the ice cream cone. And then he comes back the next day. He comes back tomorrow, right? And he says, I'm, I'm here for my free cone. And the ice cream um, vendor says, buy one today, get a free one tomorrow. So this keeps happening, and then all of a sudden the little boy gets frustrated because he keeps having to buy all this ice cream. And he goes, I keep coming back, to, it's tomorrow. And, and the ice cream vendor says, no son, tomorrow never comes. <laughs> it's always today, yes. So tomorrow never comes, today is the day to make a decision because tomorrow never comes. I like that story. First time I heard it, I was like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> I, I, uh, I had an opportunity to, um, to do many things in, in my life, and, and I'm here as a, as a minister, and I was not planning on being one. It's a long story, but um, I came kicking and screaming into, into ministry work. But uh, at, my, at my first police academy, um, I say first because I, I had to 
I had to go several times, not because I failed. I, that was college. I had to go to college a couple of times, don't do what I did. But uh, I, did, I, I, I switched jobs and ended up having to go through police academy again. But my first police academy, um, I thought I was, I was in pretty good shape. I was a fireman at the time and, and doing all kinds of th stuff and you know, physical stuff. And I thought I was in, in shape. And on the very first day you get there, they make you run the obstacle course. And I thought to myself, you know, all these guys out, out there and, and uh, a few ladies as well, I thought, I, I've got to, I, I really got to compete. I've, I've got to show that I got something. I bring something to the table. And so I went all out at this, at this obstacle course thing. And at the end, when I, when I got to the end of the race, you know, thinking about race stuff, I was so sick. And at that point, when you're sick, you don't really care who, who looks at you or whatever, because, I mean, I was just like right there at the edge of puking, and, and so I, I ran over, there was a trailer, I ran over, I laid down, and I'm just kind of moaning, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, don't, don't let me puke, I don't want to puke my, and, and uh, finally it, it, um, it subsided after a while. I mean, it was one of these things, you better not move, you better not look anywhere, you better not even open your eyes, or, or you're just up-chucking this is wonderful uh, Sabbath school class for the people that are watching. Um, after it was said and done, after Police Academy was over, we could run that obstacle course, and it was, you know, just a, bit, a little bit of everything, jump over walls, carry dummy uh, people, and drag them, and just all, all kinds of stuff. We could do that basically in our sleep, by the, time, by the time you ran the entire course, you, you were barely breathing hard. It was like, yeah, we, we, could, we could do it again. But there was this consistent training that came through the academy. You were always training, always training. You got up in the morning and you went straight into the gym. In that gym, you guys, you know, you hit it for, for as long as you needed to, but every single day it was like that. I'm amazed at how the Christian believes that we can navigate the things of this world without any training, without any time. Our prayers are, are, are very quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Help us strengthen our, nourish our bodies in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Uh, some of my kids have gotten so fast that I, I think it's practically, dear Jesus, amen. And sometimes I sit there at the table thinking, could you do that again? I mean, maybe twice would be why. We aren't spending the time. Uh, Amelia, you said purpose in your heart. So I want to hear from you guys. Uh, we have a few minutes, but let's talk a little bit about, and, and you can speak as I saw you read that. You can speak as somebody raises their hand. Let's talk about this concept of, of, of running the race, of, of working out, of, of purposing in your heart. How does all that happen? How can we make that a reality in a world that is feeding us all kinds of junk, a million miles an hour, all the time, taking our attention everywhere? How can we stay faithful? And while we do that, Mindy's going to talk. <laughs> well, he triggered a thought, but he kind of turned a different corner at the go, end. Go, go so, to that thought. Forget it. Go, go to that thought. So I'm going to say my thought while you guys are thinking of how you're going to respond to his question, too. But one thing that really stood out to me the most while listening to Pastor Chris last night was the intentionality when a choice came in life that Esther made intentional time to see God's face first. She didn't rush into the king. She spent time fasting and praying and seeking God's will. And I think it's so important, especially as we're a weekend of young adults and focusing, um, focused on young adults and leadership is, is just that concept of not rushing in and waiting, like we said in the back, on God's timing. Um, there was timing of when to stand up, but there's also timing and when to move forward as well. She didn't rush the process. She made that intentional time to seek God's face first and find his will. It's like in, like when you're recording stuff, like for film and stuff, the, the saying is like, hurry up and wait. You get there and, and you're there on time, but then you gotta wait because you gotta set everything up for the scene to begin. And kind of like Esther, Daniel, you know, when the decree came out that all the wise men had to be um, killed, he could have totally just freaked out, you know? But instead, what did he do? He hurried and went into the presence of God and he spent time praying, kind of like, kind of like in Esther's case. So. We need to hurry up and wait and spend time in God's presence because that is where the power is. I think I saw a hand. Susie, did you have your hand up earlier? Or? Okay. Um, as you guys were talking about purposing in your heart, I just kept going back to the Spirit of Prophecy quote, um, Ellen White in Education, 
Um, it's just such a powerful quote, and it's one I've gone back to many times in my life, and it's the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men or women, women, who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. <laughs> okay, um, well, as I was reading through this um, last night and this morning, uh, I just saw again how the power of prayer is just so profoundly throughout the whole book. And it reminded me of a quote that I wanted to share real quick. I believe it's from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, The crisis that Esther faced demanded quick, earnest action. But both she and Mordecai realized that unless God should work mightily in their behalf, their own efforts would be unfailing, unveiling. So Esther took time for communion with God, the source of her strength. And I think that's what we need to be reminded of too, that um, when we leave everything in God's hands, he, uh, he will reveal his purpose through um, what we do. Uh, yes, I agree with that, um, that total surrender is necessary. So I'm a newer convert, and um, I decided there's nothing I wouldn't walk away from. Um, just over a year ago, I was working in show production, so I was building stages for a lot of mainstream artists, very popular artists. And um, when I realized who God was, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't do that <laughs> kind of work anymore. So I left that industry. And um, a lot of my friends didn't understand and family didn't understand and I ended up losing friends and family and things like that. But um, I know that the truth is more important. So um, just standing uh, firm in that, it does take total surrender to God. It takes making that decision. Uh, you know, I'm, I can walk away from the acceptance of the culture. I can walk away from um, my reputation, what people think of me. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey since making that decision, and it seems like God has been testing me uh, a lot to see how much I meant what I said, and he will do that, but uh, through the uh, trials, uh, that's the process that uh, helps to sanctify us. Like, uh, that's the refining by fire that really helps to hollow us and purify us. So um, there's a scripture I think about, and it says it's an honor to be counted worthy to suffer for Christ or something like that. But um, I do believe that, so yeah. Thank you for that. And what, what a joy it is to, to see uh, a child of God come home. And, and really, the whole world is filled with children of God. We're, we're all children of God. And God is trying to get our attention and say, hey, hey listen, it's time to come home. There's, there's great work to be done out there, and, and I just praise the Lord for what, what He's doing in, in your life. But you brought something to, to mind, and sometimes, sometimes we think that the calling to come to the Lord is the calling for those who are living lives that are outside of, of Scripture, for example. Uh, but the reality is that the calling is for all of us. Remember when, uh, when Esther was first uh, uh, brought brought or the 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 whole issue was brought to her attention that um that the jews were going to be killed and her response was hey i can't go to the king i mean that dude he kills people when they come and and i and i'm not doing that and then the response from from mordecai mordecai was was don't think that you will escape in the throne what does that mean for the Christian? It simply means this. Don't think that you won't be brought to the fork in the road. Every single one of us are going to be brought to the fork in the road. Every single one of us are going to have to stand up and make a decision. At some point, God is going to bring you up and say, all right, here are the two roads. One road leads to death and destruction. The other road leads to eternal life. Which one are you gonna take? Every single one of us is brought to that particular position at some time. 
I want, to, I want to go back to Esther chapter 1. We have five minutes, and, and I want to make a little bit more comparison there. We, not, we didn't even get to the rest of Esther, guys. I'm so sorry. Pastor Chris will cover the rest of the, the Esther book. But um, I want you to think a little bit about this, this, uh, this cup. Uh, I think one of you guys talked about there, there were golden cups that were being used. Wine was being, being drunk in those cups. We saw that kind of language in Revelation chapter 14, 8. We saw that kind of language in, in Revelation chapter 17. What was in the cup, the golden cup that, uh, that was full of wine, what was in the cup of the harlot in Revelation chapter 17? Anybody remember? Fornication, abominations, sins. This is, the, this is the wine that the world is giving to the world. This abominable wine that we take in as nourishment. That's what the world is giving us. I see Amelia reaching for a mic. Go ahead. I just was thinking about the cup. And this is, this is just, it takes too long to tie this all together, but um, the cup of that, we see several cups in the Bible, right? We hear about this. We see, we see cups here. We see that cup in Revelation that the harlot has was full of abominations and all these terrible things. And then we hear of also the cup in Revelation chapter 14, also of like the cup of his indignation is poured out. And then when Jesus prays in the garden, he says, Father, take this cup away from me. So what does that infer if he's asking for the cup to be taken from him, that he would have to drink it? And we can see that Jesus, he took, he paid the penalty for us. He drank the cup. He drank the cup of the wrath of God. He drank the cup of that indignation, all the abominations. That is the cup that he took for us, which is mind-blowing. And, and I love that. I love how you've connected that because I think that's going to be sort of uh, our, our end. L looking at these two cups, looking at the, the, the cup of the indignation and receiving that cup, who will receive that cup, looking at the cup of the abominations. Let's look at that as, as we close. What is the abomination chapter in Scripture? Anybody know? We're just constantly, look, look at this, look at the abominations that they're committing. Look at this. I see a hand right there. It's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter? Uh, is it four? or 28? You got the eight part, right? Eight. <laughs> eight. Very good. Ezekiel chapter eight. And you, if you look at Ezekiel chapter eight, and we don't have time to look at it, but you'll consistently see that God is, God is bringing Ezekiel and saying, let me, let me show you what God's people are doing. Let me, let me just show you. I don't, I don't even want to talk to you about it. I'm just going to show you what God's people are doing. And, and he takes them to one. He's like, look at what they're doing here. Look at this abomination. You thought that was bad. Let, let me just show you this. Oh, no, that's nothing. Let me, let me now show you this down. The entire chapter is like that, all of the abominations. Read that when you get home tomorrow, because today you're going to be here all day long, and we're going to be listening to Pastor Hall and everybody else. So read that tomorrow. But I want you to go to Ezekiel and go to Ezekiel chapter 9, because this is what happens after Ezekiel chapter 8. After all of the showing, Ezekiel chapter 9. Nine, and let's read. Let's read there. Let's uh, let's get you to read Ezekiel chapter nine if you have that here. You can. You, you want to read my Bible here? Ezekiel chapter nine. Just read until I tell you to stop. Okay. Then he called out in the hearing with a. Hold on. Let's restart. <laughs> then he called out in my hearing with the loud voice, saying, "Let those who have charge over the city draw near." each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the, the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with uh, his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a written, had a written inkhorn as his, at his side. Uh, they went, in, went in and stood beside the bronze altar, and now, uh, now the glory the, of the uh, of God, is of Israel has gone up to the cherub, where it has been uh, to the threshold of the temple, and he called the man clothed with linen who had the uh, writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go th throughout the midst of the city, th throughout the midst of, Jer of Jerusalem, and put a mark of, on his forehead, 
of the man who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Okay, stop there. Notice the storyline here. So after the abominations, he says, look at all the abominations that are happening, and, and then you have Ezekiel chapter 9. And he calls these, these six angelic beings, represent, re, representing the, the, the end time reaping type of, type of thing, and, and he says, go, come here with your battle axes, but then there's a guy with an inkhorn, and he says, go put a mark on those that I don't want you to touch with the battle axe. Who are the people that God said protect? Those who sigh and cry over the abominations of the world. Who are those? Friends, those are those who pray. God is saying, don't touch the people that pray. But for the rest, what verse did you stop? Here it is. To the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young, men, maidens, and little children and women, but do not come near anyone and who, on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Hey, listen, friends. There are just two sides. That's it. There's two sides. There's two sides. There's God's side, and there's the devil's side. The world is giving everybody wine, of abominable things to drink, and they're taking that in as nourishment. And God is saying, there's a day that I'm going to come, and I'm going to have to pour my wrath on all of the wicked and all who decide to drink of that cup. But there's a way out. There's a way to be saved. And that way is on your knees, those who pray. If we want to be in the last part of the last people that stand, we have to be found as the people that pray. God is looking for a people who will pray, who will look at the things that the world has to offer, and like this young lady says and did in her life, I don't want the world anymore. I don't want it. I choose Jesus. And so the appeal for you this morning, friends, as Pastor Holland told us very clearly, there is nothing in this world that is worth it, guys. There's nothing. Solomon, who had all the money in the world, had all the wealth in the world, and he could have anything he wanted, at the end he said, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Only a relationship with Jesus is worth it. So we want to encourage you. Walk with the Lord. Spend time in his word and pray like mad. This world is coming to a quick end. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for, for the fact that you have not left us. Although, Lord, we're not deserving the mercy and the grace that you, that you bestow on us, Father, although we're, we're fallen, we're sinful, we're dirty, Lord, we're broken, you specialize in putting together that which is broken. You put the pieces back together, Lord, and you place your spirit in us and then when the Father sees us as you present us as your children, Lord, he sees your perfection, Jesus' perfection, that is. And so this morning, Father, we ask that you will move on our hearts, that you will change us, that you will transform us, that you will take these broken hearts out and you will replace them with new hearts. And, Father, that we will reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Keep us on our knees as we go into the last days. Help us to stand like Vashti and Esther and Mordecai. Mordecai. And, Father, that when you come, you will find us faithful. And we thank you, Father, for what you do for us and what you're doing for us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.